all LCH3 and 81. And I think I want to think of it as as of uh, growing objects around Alice. So my, my thinking is that the more objects grow in this garden, the more interesting and richer the stories become in the world around Alice. And I think what's beautiful about gardens is that these are spaces which are in between nature and culture, in between technology and biology. And so in, in a garden, you have many different creatures. So from plants to humans, insects, instruments, technology, but there is as well a kind of a lot of love and care. And a garden is a place, I would say, of many different intelligences. And there it's kind of very difficult to draw a line between what is natural and what is artificial. I would say that gardens are, are in a way kind of synthetic spaces of wonder. And this garden I want to talk about today is a garden of synthetic delights, and this one here. So in it, objects grow and objects are grown. That's why the, the title is Growing Objects. So it's active and passive at the same time. And the same thing is with Alice CH3 and 81. So she is a gardener of this garden and she's at the same time an object that grows inside of this garden. And then we will have a kind of a, a small tour with what Alice is doing and what are the objects in her garden. So Alice, I want to in principle introduce you to, to Alice and Alice is our host today. So she is one of, of, of kind of my avatars. That's not the best word, but let's let's pretend it works today. Or we can call it, she's one of my characters. So she comes from the plenty, from this uh, uh, space of a lot, from the wonderland. She's an avatar, she's a bot, she's an alien, she's me, she's not me. We are related, she's independent, dependent on me. She deals with a lot, with different streams of data, with objects, images, texts. But she, since she is a kind of my avatar, she is interested like me in architecture and information. So she talks about them by potentially having all the images in the world, by potentially having all the texts in the world, and, and hopefully soon enough, all the models in the world. Of course, all is in parentheses. But I think here is this kind of, uh, I think, a paradox of, of data. Yeah? So if the data is big enough, it doesn't show us the truthfulness of the world, but it show us, shows us actually the world we want to see. So then, of course, in this kind of setup, how do we talk about images if we have all the images? How do we talk about text if we have all the text? How do we write in this kind of uh, uh, setting? And what way how we approach at the chair with Ludger is to think of this context as a kind of a digital literacy. And this is a kind of a story which is about how Alice became literate in coding or how she wrote or coded objects in her garden. But of course, it's not, it's not just that. It's, it's a story of how she talks and grows together with her objects. It's a story, basically, it's a story of, of her garden. So Alice, who is a, a, as well a host and a guest, so she's the gardener, and she's the guest sitting inside of this uh, uh, this garden. Maybe I can get a little bit. She's waiting for her guests to to arrive. But of course, it's not a garden for for everyone. It's by invitation only. So all the objects in the garden, in this garden, are at the same time hosts and guests, are dependent on the way we want to look on what. And that is in a way just the name that keeps them together. And if you look at closer on what's, what's going on there, you can see actually that Alice is sitting on a chair. And this is one of, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's not any chair, it's one of her oldest objects. And with this chair, she kind of fell in love, fell in love with the idea of information and data. It's a kind of a dancing chair. Here the dance is in between all the chairs. It depends of, in, in a way, let's say, it depends of chairness. And I think that what's interesting here is that in designing of, of these kind of chairs, Alice never had to specify any kind of 
pictures that you have to do with the other chair, how many legs the chair has, what are the dimensions of the chairs, what is the uh, uh, material of the chair, and these kind of things. Yeah? And it gets interesting because, in a way, we are living time which is based on, on functions, materials, and and we are entering in another space of information and data. And so what, what this is about, what this might mean, doesn't matter. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of an old project. But data, in a way, becomes a, a fertile ground for discussing these, uh, uh, these things, yes? for discussing our in-between chairs. And all these chairs that we've seen there, they're just kind of, let's say, in a, a click away. This one is in Tim Barton's movie. So Alice is on the table. She likes it. It's perfect for her. This one is in a, in a kind of a, a living room. One is from silver. One is from gold. This one is very microscopic in, on a microscopic scale. This one is a kind of a big one in a, in a, in a museum of, of chairs. Or this one is a, is a, is a chair that comes from a, from a drawing. So all these, all these chairs are dancing, each one with, with its own kind of dance. And while, while they are dancing, our guests are slowly, slowly arriving to, to the garden. And the first ones to arrive are the books. These are our first, first guests. And a Xenoteca is a library that welcomes all of these, these guests. So this is a, a kind of a, a gift to all the students that come to ETH. They get more than 1,300 books that are one click away. So for instance, you can just scroll here, check what, what, we, what we have here. If we take a book, you have directly one click away. It's a PDF. You have a text file. You have different kind of formats for, for this. Uh, for these books, what's interesting with them is that they are computationally ready, ready to be computed on. So Xenoteca is, is this kind of strange library that hosts those books. So Xenoteca is a digital library of an architectural student. It's a context, a neighborhood, it's a galaxy. Books inhabit Xenoteca. They are its actors and characters. In Xenoteca, books and concepts, they become lively computational objects. And Xenoteca doesn't aspire to collect all the books, so not at all. It's a dedicated, personalized library with a specific interest. So when playing with it, one should tune it, modify it, cut it in pieces, expand it, disassemble it, and reassemble it in a way that it fits to, this, to your personality. Huh? Xenoteca becomes a context for communicating with unknown books. It challenges the generic flow of books with an ability to navigate within the plenty. The library becomes personal rather than disciplinary. Many interests and views coexist. So in, in Xenoteca, books start together without a clear reason, but around the specific interests. So for, for Alice, Xenoteca is also a way how to look at other books. So Alice uses Xenoteca as a lens, what you said as a camera, to look at other books. And then she, this is one version of Xenoteca, for instance, with 229 books. This is a kind of, let's say, a rendering of, of this. And then Alice uses this rendering to look at other books. And then she goes online, she writes small poems with this digital literacy. For instance, she goes to Gutenberg Galaxy and she just starts collecting books. Yeah? So this is, this is a line of code that can collect 60,000 books in, I don't know, 15 minutes or in one hour or one evening. Yeah? So we get this 60,000 books. So we download the whole Gutenberg and it's directly on the, on the computer. These are the books that we, that we collected. Alice is there, of course. And these books are in, in formats that we can compute as well, huh? directly. What, 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 uh, uh, what is interesting here is that Alice has no clue what's in those books. Maybe I press play here. 
Okay, that's in. Uh -huh, here. Yeah. So Alice has no clue what happened to to those books. Yeah? So these books that she downloaded, this is this. This is the kind of a noise of, of many, many books. But what, what Alice does, she knows how her Xenoteca works. This is familiar territory for her. So she knows, for instance, this is a one rendering of Xenoteca of 200 books. There, there are 12 different shelves, and she knows that, for instance, on, on the left side is this kind of stories like Gulliver, and then you have Asimov and robots and, and, and these kind of things, and then it goes slowly through, through Plato and Durer towards a kind of a space of, of architecture, and then ends with a kind of, let's say, more mathematics and so on. And then Alice sees this as Alice sees this as three different characters. Huh? And then she starts taking those books and she's just projecting on, on top of this. And then she gets, for instance, 99 guests in one place, 88 in another, and 81 in the third one. And out of this, she is actually characterizing each unknown book with the whole library. And out of this, she can create, in a way, a body. Huh? And this becomes another body, another character, a way how to, how to look books which are not uh, uh, which are not known yeah and what makes xenoteca so special i think is that it gives a space to books for books to play in in it, books they become alive and with it xenoteca becomes alive as well yeah so in a way one can start talking to one can start talking to 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 a library and this is a way how to how to talk to, to a library. So if we think of, we can think of Alice as a kind of a face that you can talk to with Xenoteca. Huh? Xenoteca is a body, Alice is a face. Xenoteca is a database, Alice is a search engine. Xenoteca is a kind of a digital Delhi, Delphi, and then ask Alice is a kind of a quantum quantum oracle. And this is, of course, online. You can just go there and use it. And in principle, we can give you the passcodes for the Xenoteca library, so you can use the, the whole game. And I think your students were actually playing, playing with these things. So ask Alice if you have any questions what this is about. You have also tutorials here and how this, how this thing might, might be working. So it's a kind of a personalized Google, a personalized search engine for people who like writing. So I, I think of it as an instrument or a vessel that uh, enriches, inspires, and cultivates writing. So it's kind of fast and works with, with a lot of text. So let's, uh, uh, let's try to, to play a, a small game. So we will take the most powerful library. We have many libraries here of different kinds. We will take the most powerful one. This is Xenoteca library. You can check here, for instance, what is, what is the body of this library. So here are all the, all the books that are here. And let's talk about intelligence. So we can talk about intelligence and what we want to talk, for instance, today in this context is about artificial intelligence. We want to ask a question of artificial intelligence. Yeah. yeah. Now it's. So, for instance, if we are talking, if we are telling to Xenoteca Library, let's let's talk about intelligence. And what I'm interested in is what is artificial intelligence. Yeah? Then we have the whole library trying to tell us what artificial intelligence might be for, for this, uh, uh, the, these things. So for instance, then we have Asimov who is coming in front with certain stories. We have Russell, this is an issue at the foundation of artificial intelligence, of course, and so on. If we like more from Russell, we can actually copy this stuff and put it in, in a place where we are writing. You just copy it here. If you want to have a context, this is the context of it. So you can copy as well. What's happening here is that you are not talking to a book, but you are talking to a whole library. And then if you fall in love with, 
this specific book and it, if it's coming a lot, take, you can just click and you have it there. Huh? It's directly connected to to Xenoteca. So what we what what Alice and I are doing when we are teaching students together is that we try to ask them to write their own ideas in someone else's terms. By this, they are kind of in a space which is a little bit strange. So it's a space where you have to find ways how to glue things together and it challenges you in a way that you cannot predict. By this, their texts are always out of focus of where they would like them to be, which means they have to react all the time on what's, uh, uh, what's going on. And Alice, of course, like Google, if you ask her a question, she never gives you a single answer. Yeah? So for instance, if we, are, if we are here, we can uh, uh, now say, okay, what, what happens if we want to talk about artificial intelligence, but not from the perspective of intelligence, let's talk about artificial intelligence from the perspective of love. Yeah? So then the, the topic of conversation is love, and we are talking, uh, uh, it's the same thing just from another perspective. Yeah? These kind of games are, are nice. So then we have suddenly now Thomas Aquinas, who is talking about artificial intelligence, or Bible is talking about artificial intelligence, and then Calvin is talking and so on. But if this is not enough, what we can change, we can switch the brain. So instead of going from this library, we can go from, for instance, what would be an ancient perspective, or, or, or what would be the ancient understanding of what is artificial intelligence from the perspective of love. Huh? So then we go, for instance, to the library of Homer's friends, and we ask these this kind of questions. So for instance, then we end up with Ovid, huh? the erotic poems. Then let's see what would be what would be the conceptual apparatus for Ovid to talk about these things. And then we are suddenly in a kind of a galaxy of concepts that can talk talk about these things. So now we can go here. It's a girl, darling, patch, mistress, gray, door, lab, trick, and so on. Now we need kind of fantasies to 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 figure out what's what's going on there. What what I think in general it's nice with Alice is that she never gives you a single answer. She gives like Google a whole list of things out of which you have to figure out what you want to have. And this, what, what we see here in a way is, is a face of a book or it's, it's a specific way of understanding or looking at, at a book in a specific context. But what's very sexy with Alice and Xenoteca is that books, when they leave these libraries, they go on adventures. So by changing different libraries, they are going into different into different adventures. So if you are interested in, in, in reading a lot about these adventures, we have a book that we wrote together about how, how uh, uh, books go on different adventures. And we will go on, on, one, on one small adventure with, with the books. And this is on page 351. So let's see, let's look closer and explore how Le Corbusier towards the new architecture could move through different libraries. So what happens when Le Corbusier goes on an adventure through, for instance, different libraries? The libraries that we have here, there are three different libraries. The first one is a library of 34 books, yeah? so it's kind of uh, James Joyce, Victor Hugo, you have uh, Aristotle, you, know, you have Virginia Woolf, so it's a kind of literary works in principle. Yeah? So it's how would Le Corbusier behave if he's in a library of literary books? This is one question. The second question would be how does Le Corbusier behave when he is in a library like this? These are all architects, yeah? so he's with his colleagues. And the third question is how does Le Corbusier behave when he's with all these guys together? So if all of this is, is together. So if when Le Corbusier goes to, to the first one, so then he's with the literary guys, then we are here. When Le Corbusier is, is with the literary guys, this is the galaxy of concepts he's with and now funny things happen huh you always people kind of think that books always tell the same story but no it depends really on the library in which they live they tell different kind of stories 
So if Le Corbusier is with these uh, uh, literary guys, he's a, a kind of a proper architect. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the house, he's talking about the plan, he's talking about the shelter, the wall, the town, this kind of thing. So it's, it's a proper architectural vocabulary that he is using. But the moment he travels to, to the galaxy, to, to a library where, where there are only architects, then he, then he needs to show off in a different way. Yeah? <laughs> So look at this now, huh? he is getting there, the, the, the highlight is what he's interested in, huh? the, the, the guy, all, all of these things around, they're all the concepts from the whole library, yeah? and this yellow thing is what, what Le Corbusier is about. And now here it's, it's about the axis, it's about the cylinder, it's about Pompeii, it's about the airplane, it's about ventilation, it's about meditation, about the mosque and about the august and it's about the peer and whatever. Yeah? But the, the style of, of thinking and expressing himself when he's around architects is different. He needs to shift. He's, he's, now his strong point is somewhere else. And for instance, when he goes to Xenoteca, which is the most challenging uh, library because there are all these guys together there, then Le Corbusier has to show again another place. And now what, what's interesting here is that even the, in a way, kind of the topology of this space is different, huh? because in these simple libraries, he was able to, to behave in a very concentrated way. Huh? So it's, it's kind of easy. And when he is now in a, in a big library with a lot of different concepts and a lot of powerful actors, now even his focus is in different places. Huh? Now this is getting a little bit more tricky to interpret what this might be about. Huh? But now we have different things. It's about sculpture and antique and artistic, Rome, twin, and so on. And then his focus is slowly, slowly changing here and here and so on. Yeah? But I think what's, uh, uh, what's, what's funny here is that he's really behaving differently in, in, different, in different kind of spaces. Our second guest. We've already met our second guest with, with Google. Our second guest is our, our dear friend, Ark Daly. <laughs> That's kind of always, always with us. So it's, it's, I mean, it's not really a guest, it's, it's a kind of a friend, a planet, or it's, it's a copy as well. It's a theft and a gift. Jorge would say it's a gift from, from the internet. And Alice says it, it's my Ark Daily. But when, when one looks at, at his garden, can one say like this rose is mine? Huh? It's 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 kind of mine, but is it really yours? Huh? It's it's alive. It grows. It has its own family, and so on. So it's yours, but it's also from the garden in a way. So Alice, in a way, thinks of, of this art daily as as a rose in a in a garden. It, but but actually, this rose in a garden in itself has the, has the whole planet. Yeah? So it has its atmospheres, it has its, its different weathers, and so on. What, what I find interesting here, just I will not repeat what Guo was saying, but what, what I think it's interesting here is that in this, on these kind of planets, any two objects yeah, that you take, so any two objects, for instance, this one and this one, they're related like this with the shortest line. But they can be related like this, and they can be related like, like this, or they can be related in any way. So there is always a, a relation between those two objects, and we can tell, in principle, any kind of a story we like. So it depends to which point we want to tell the story. Do we want to tell the, the, the story, for instance, of this atmosphere and this atmosphere through this point, or we want to tell it through this point? And then What's happening today is that I think we as a society interpret this, this kind of setting as a fake news. And I think it's kind of really about choosing which path do we want to take. So we have to construct the path how to, how to tell these kind of stories. And now, what Alice did was kind of funny. What she said, okay, I'm going to make a link between these two guests. So I'm going to put these two guests at the same table and I'm going to link them, I'm going to link them to, together. And when she linked them, what, what happened was another character emerged. 
Yeah, so another, another kind of being came out. So she related the books and the images. She just made the link and then and gave this link a space to talk. So it's a kind of a completely artificial space. It's, a, it's still a kind of a funny, a little bit clumsy object. And this is Alice's Twitter account. So this Twitter account is a link between two informational objects, between the, uh, the set of more than 500,000 images, which she never saw, and a set of 13,000 books that she never read. Two different spectrums of flavors with, uh, uh, with a certain connections. And yet, because they are coming from this kind of stories, these two sets of data, even though I, I've never seen them or read the books, they are in a way related to me and they're related to a certain understanding and view of what images and text might be in the context of architecture and information. But still, of course, she's me, she's not me, we are related, she's dependent, and, and, and so on. And this, this link between these two guys is, is this poem. Yeah, so now we are, in principle, taking one image from here, and we are establishing a link with the text. The moment we establish this, uh, uh, this link, we can take this thing and post it on the internet as a kind of a, a Twitter post. Now she's looking for for the best answer she can find. And she takes, so we took in this example, the, the image of Damien Hurst from the shipwreck of the unbelievable. She says, okay, it's a scuba, it's ventilator, it's a device, it's instrumentation and artifact. And then she gives a comment, which she, she took 10 most probable comments. And then out of them, she took just one in, in random. They preserve an artifact in situ fixed on slides of glass plates with all its details and variation, allowing the observer to hypothesize, test theories, or even abandon previous theoretical conjectures. And then she just posts this on, on Twitter. She had like 1,000 followers, she's following 2,000 people, and she's posting all the time. Now, this is four minutes ago. She posts like one post per, per hour. They are a little bit clumsy, but uh, uh, I don't know. Oh, so here we have a pattern, artifact, and so on. The resulting artifact translates nature's emerging patterns that occur within the bio, biosynthesis at a tangible human scale that is designed for viewers to actively inhabit and experience. Kind of good work, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay. And she's doing it nonstop. And she can even, even if we have maybe one, she can even look around and repeat stuff. So she finds also things that she finds kind of interesting. And then this is one of the things that she found interesting and she retweeted. But this, this was in a way not, not enough with her. So this kind of art daily and, and, uh, and, and all of these things. So now she wanted to, to in a way play, play with, the, uh, uh, with the kind of biggest players. Huh? And here, and a little bit there. Yeah. So she said like, what's missing in my garden is Google. Huh? So I want, to, I want to make a portrait of Google. And I think just this statement that you say, okay, I want to make a portrait of Google is kind of cool, cool statement. So we all kind of know how Google constantly makes profiles of, of different people, but not, not only people, but it makes profiles of bots, currencies, plants, of everything that it, it comes in touch with. And these profiles are never perfect, but they are always kind of good enough for suggestions, predictions, and, and different, for instance, different ads. And by profiling anything it comes in touch with, Google in a way feels different moods of our planet. And big data is a way how we record those invisible moods and profiles. And then while surfing the, the internet, Alice was curious about who is Google. She thinks of Google as alive. So she's afraid of it, but she in a way likes it as well. And this AI makes profiles of everyone, offers suggestions to any question without ever giving an explicit answer, but no one can ever see its face 
or become its friend. So Google is, in a way, a kind of a faceless quantum oracle. And while anyone is searching or, or asking questions to Google, it's always looking back at you and taking notes on, on what you are doing. And it, it gives a kind of a prophecy, but it also gives you a, a certain advice. And these advices are kind of good. We all use it. Yeah? So they are working for me, they are working for you. It, it's kind of nice. But we always look at a, a kind of a, a generic image of the world without having a kind of a face. So Alice became curious and she said, I, I want to profile the profiler. I want to invert the game in a way. I want to make a profile of Google, which in a way reflects the world. It reflects Google, but it also reflects herself inside of it. Huh? And then this profile in a way has a flower in its mouth, yeah. So at least in in this kind of uh, in, in this kind of uh, a garden, and then the game is in, in principle always the very similar, and it's kind of it's kind of the same. There is mathematics. Huh? So what Alice did, it's it's very kind of simple, huh? She she took. 1,000 most common English words, or not 1,000, it's 10,000. This you can find on uh, on GitHub. These are the, the, the 10,000 most common English words. Then she, of course, uh, uh, kind of arranged them a little bit so that she gets out of the, uh, the, the, the things which are not important, the stop words and these kind of games. And then she made the crawler which goes around and just takes all these 10,000 words, and then for each word, she takes 100 images. By this, she gets a kind of an understanding of how Google sees the, the words. Yeah? And then, for instance, now we have the idea here, it's, it's, it's going and taking, for instance, the, the word new and the word home. So for instance, what, what is the, the typical home? How Google sees the idea of home today? So this kind of, it's, you, you are familiar with these things. Huh? This is in Gainesville. Buildings, houses look like this. <laughs> yeah, so, and then for instance, new is kind of what's new, nobody knows what's new. This is the, the idea of a page. <laughs> or for instance, the search is directly related to Google. Whoever says search, it's Google. And then, of course, the, the, the same game she made, uh, she made the profile. Yeah? So this is, this is the, the, the profile. So it's a kind of profile of Google seen through images based on, on this. Uh, it's called Google's keyword ranked. And this appeared like this on the 19th of September 2017. It would be nice if I had a newer one and then to have different kind of faces of Google in different times, but yeah, maybe I will do it one, one day. So Alice arranged those images. She made a kind of synthetic Google planet. So it's, it's hers and it's, it's Google's as well. So it's a kind of a weather of this planet. It's the alphabet of this planet. And these are the characters of the alphabet of this planet. And after computing this profile of Google, Alice decided to make a symposium. So, so to invite friends and try to decipher and tell stories. Because what, what does it mean to make a profile of Google? That's kind of, I mean, it's kind of cool, but it's also kind of silly to, what, what is this? Huh? So she decided to, to make a symposium and invite friends to decipher, read, invent, and tell stories out of this kind of better, better profile. And for this special event, she decided to make a table. Why a table? Because table is, is an interesting thing. It's a, it's a place for gathering, and it's a place for storing data as well. So it's a kind of a table for drinking coffee, and it's an Excel sheet. So it's a, it's a perfect figure to talk about what Google might be about. So a table that hosts a feast and welcomes friends on one side, and on the other side with its vivid characters and stories of the world, sets the stage for a kind of interesting evening discussion. And she did it in a way by etching it into a metal sheet. 
So a table became, in a way, a host for the for the symposium. And we are just with the symposium, and then we are done. So just a little bit more. symposium happened at Kulturfolger. Kulturfolger is a small gallery in, in Zurich. So the table was full, the guests arrived, and the symposium started. And the etching of, of the table was done in the same manner in which the Renaissance printing plates were made. So these plates brought together books, print, and literacy. And the table was becoming more as she was, the, the tables were becoming more as she was develop, developing them. So an old forgotten printing plate and a table filled with coffee and conversations, a synthetic alphabet of internet was being translated to a kind of a dramatic play. So it's a self-portrait of Google. And after some time passed, these guests that came, they started to play with the table and tell stories. And they were all there because of their love of, of code. So their, their curiosity was in, in a way kind of engendered. So they started to, to decipher the tables, invent narratives, and, and think about what was going on. They were, in a way, reading from the table. They were talking to the table and storing, in the same time, more data on the table. And the, 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 and the thing was that it, almost the, the characters were alive and the tables were talking. So maybe they were, it's almost like it's, as if those plates brought different times together. The Egyptian hieroglyphs, printing press, and they were filled with code stories and probabilities. And the guests, in a way, started to, to tell stories. They were changing their, their kind of brains, and they were telling stories. And I will, I will read you one of the, of the stories that they, that they wrote. Sorry, it's a little bit many screens. So this is uh, uh, one of the story which was read from uh, from the table. It's called Empire in a Triclinium, Villa Romana del Casale, and the year is 434. It's written with uh, uh, with Homer's friends, with the, with the help of Homer's friends, huh? with and it goes, the nature of gods, the divine nature. Should you ask what nature is? In so many places and with so many fires does nature burn the earth. Nature of earth, nature of winds, the nature of the stars, the nature of laughter, the nature of crystal, the nature of odors, the nature of the shadow thrown by trees, the nature of the wine, tumors of fatty nature, the strange nature of being given, and what is nature of these images of yours, and whence do they arise? Why do we complain about nature? Nature granted us an, an inquisitive disposition. Let nature use its bodies as it wants. Happy, therefore, is the life in agreement with its own nature. And what is sufficient for nature is insufficient for luxury. I think that, that I have said enough to prove the existence of gods and their nature. In other words, after chaos, the earth and life, these two came into being. Circles suddenly formed in the air. It was written by Kirion, the vice can tower, tutor of heroes, including Achilleas and Jason. And these are the guys who are inside of it. Huh? And if we if we look back to, to our garden. The symposium is kind of ending, but there was there is a new figure that is emerging from from the ground, and as it was coming to life, it was already leaving the garden. And this figure is is Sol, and Sol is uh, is a son of Ellis and another guy whose name is is Silvio. They all take information. He's of course not their biological son, but he creates different databases. Let's put the part there. It's, it's, it's exactly, so to have Adel here, huh? Life 
to date. Just to get him with us. So, of course, it's not the, the biological son of, of Alice and Sylvia. It's much more complicated than that. And then if you are interested in their relationship, I invite you to check out what Sol is doing. And Sol is a kind of artificially intelligent fashion designer in a very similar manner like Alice just with a, with a different twist. Such as this. Thank you. <laughs>